Seat belts, airbags, even ejector seats in planes. We take these types of safety devices for granted and they have saved thousands of lives. Virtually anything that carries people these days, from cars to planes to spacecraft, have been tested using sophisticated test dummies. But that wasn't always the case. In the early days of jet aircraft and at the beginning of the space race, some truly brave people risked life and limb in some amazing experiments. Curious Droid. In the 1950s, with a new generation of high-speed jets taking to the skies, escaping from a damaged plane, high-speed banking and acceleration, the risk of high-altitude flying, and even crash landing all became great unknowns. In the past, animals or even deceased human bodies, cadavers, had been used in tests. The problem with this kind of test subject is that they couldn't operate equipment during the test or report back as to what had happened to them and what the effects were not only on their physical condition, but also, just as importantly, on how it affected their mental capabilities. However, one man, Captain John Stapp, a medical doctor and qualified flight surgeon for the USAF, was willing to push the boundaries of what was thought possible, not by performing tests on animals and dummies, but on himself. His first assignment was with the Aero Medical Lab and was into the effects of high altitude flight. In 1946, Stapp was flown in the rear of a heavily modified B-17 bomber into the stratosphere to a height of around 45,000 feet to see how it would be possible for the crew to survive the cold and lack of oxygen. These tests would be crucial for the future of aviation. One of the mysteries of high altitude flying was how they could stop the bends or high altitude sickness from occurring. This is the same condition that affected deep sea divers when they ascended back to the surface too quickly. This happened in the very low pressure atmosphere at high altitudes or in sudden decompression events. Nitrogen, which is normally dissolved in the blood, comes out of solution and forms gas bubbles, causing anything from pain and rashes to confusion, unconsciousness, or even death in a very short space of time. Stapp spent 65 hours in the back of a B-17 performing different tests on himself. In the end, he discovered that if you breathed pure oxygen for 30 minutes prior to the flight, the condition could be eradicated. This is because he was effectively flushing nitrogen out of his body with pure oxygen. This was a major breakthrough and his next task was to lead the Aeromedical Lab's most important research project into the effects of deceleration on the human body. And it would lead him and his crew to performing some truly eye-watering experiments. One of the reasons why the USAF wanted to explore the effects of deceleration was at the time it was thought that 18 Gs was the limit that any human could survive. Because 18 Gs was the upper limit, things like harnesses and seats were only rated and built to handle that amount. However, in numerous occasions on aircraft carriers, pilots had survived high-speed crashes and higher forces that should have killed them, and yet they walked away. And then others had proved fatal at very low speed because their harnesses or the plane's structure had failed. There was also the upcoming problem of supersonic jet flight and the need to eject at supersonic speeds. No one knew if the crew could survive such an ejection. The experiments would take place at a 609 meter long track at the Murrock base, later renamed Edwards Air Force Base. This had previously been used to test captured German V-1 flying bombs. A rocket-powered sled, nicknamed the G-Wiz, with a wooden windshield to protect the occupant, would be propelled down the track, and at the other end, a set of hydraulic brakes in the track would slow it from 240 kilometers per hour to half that in one-fifth of a second. This would simulate the G-forces of a plane crash. The sled was meant to use an 84-kilogram dummy named Oscar 8-Ball, but Stapp had other ideas and told the Northrop manager that he would be the test subject. Before Stapp did any tests on himself, the system had to be tested thoroughly as any mistake could prove fatal. During one of the setup tests, they sent Oscar 8 Ball down the track with just a lap belt. When the sled hit the brakes, they locked up, instantly producing 30 Gs. 
the belt broke and Oscar went through a two and a half centimeter thick wooden windshield as if it were paper and ended up some 216 meters past the end of the track. Clearly, better harnesses were going to be required. After 35 test runs and eight months, Stapp thought he and his team had enough experience to start man tests. The first one was with Stapp on the G-Wiz facing backwards using just one rocket. This reached 145 kilometers an hour and 10 G. The next day, he added two more rockets and reached 320 kilometers an hour with no ill effects. Further tests with increasing speeds and differing deceleration rates followed and by August 1948, Stapp had done 16 tests and survived up to 35 G. Although Stapp found the earlier tests easy, the later ones were much more stressful, with him suffering concussions, a broken wrist and cracked ribs. The most disturbing effect Stapp noted was the whiteouts when facing backwards in the sled. This was because the blood was leaving his eyes and pooling in the back of his head under the high g-forces. When he changed face forwards, he experienced red outs. This time the pressure of the blood being forced forwards was bursting the capillaries in his eyes. This remained a constant issue throughout the later tests, proving that the eyes were the most vulnerable parts. Although to be totally accurate, it was the blood or the lack of it which was causing the problem. Although Stapp was reprimanded for exceeding the 18G limit, the data he collected was so useful he was told to use chimpanzees instead. He had already proved the inefficiency of many harnesses fitted to aircraft and that rear-facing passengers in planes were much more likely to survive a crash than forward-facing ones. The Air Force immediately changed the harnesses in its planes and reconfigured its troop transport planes for rear-facing passengers. But there was still the issue of supersonic ejection and that was beyond the limits of the G-Wiz. Although Stapp did some tests in a special open cockpit F-89, what became clear was that a new test vehicle was required. In 1953, a new track was built with a new rocket-powered sled called the Sonic Wind 1. This was capable of reaching 1,200 kilometers an hour and withstanding 150 G. Instead of using brakes, the sled would run through a water trough and use scoops to catch and redirect the water to create the braking. In November 1953, Stapp was fired down the track at 677 kilometers per hour. When the sled hit the water, it generated 22 G, dropping to 15 G for 0.6 seconds, twice as long as on the G Wiz. Stapp said afterwards that he felt fine and that he hoped to do it again later that day. It actually took five months to do the next test, but this time it would be forward facing with no windshield just a helmet and visor like a pilot would be wearing and the sled speed would be wound up to the max. This would be Stapp's 29th and final test. The sled would also be followed by a T-33 jet fighter to observe and take photos of the test from above. As the run started, the sled accelerated to 1,017 kilometers per hour by six rockets, making Stapp the fastest man on earth faster than a bullet and exposing him to a wind pressure of nearly two tons and an acceleration force of 20 g. Joe Kittinger, who piloted the chase plane, said that the sled went past him as if he was standing still and he had the throttle wide open doing 560 kilometers an hour. Kittinger said that when the sled hit the water break, it looked like it hit a concrete wall. So quick was the deceleration, he couldn't believe anyone would survive it. But survive it, Stapp did. He endured 46.2 Gs for 1.1 seconds, the equivalent of a pilot ejecting at Mach 1.6 at 40,000 feet. The jolt he received was greater than that of a car driver hitting a brick wall at 195 kilometers an hour. When the medics got to the sled, Stapp was conscious, but when they saw his eyes, they were completely filled with blood. He was taken to hospital and feared that he might have gone too far this time and blinded himself. But within 24 hours, his sight had returned to almost normal. Stapp was preparing for an even faster test of 1,600 kilometers an hour, that's a thousand miles an hour. 
but the top brass thought he was pushing his luck too far and didn't allow him to continue, which was just as well because during an unmanned 80G test, the sled came off the rails and was severely damaged. If it had been on board at the time, he would have been killed. Stapp became a great advocate for better safety in cars. In 1966, and because of his work, it became a law to have seat belts fitted in cars in the US. Although others had done tests too, Stapp had taken it to the limit and then some. Soon dummies would take over, but Stapp would continue his work with the aviation and automobile industry up until his death in 1999 at the age of 89. If you've ever wondered what sort of forces are involved if you were to jump out of a tree without breaking your leg, for example, then our sponsor Brilliant.org can help you find out. Brilliant is a problem-solving website where you can learn by solving real-world problems and have fun whilst doing so. If it seems like it might be too difficult, then there is a large active community ready and willing to help you. And there's also that sense of satisfaction of knowing that you've done something you thought you couldn't do. Whether you're still at school, in work or enjoying your retirement, you can still find a challenge and learn whilst you do so. To support Curious Droid and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org forward slash Curious Droid and sign up for free. So if you're ready to test yourself, the first 200 people will get a 20% discount off of the annual premium subscription.